Welcome to Music Breakdown, Columbus, Ohio's own music analysis podcast. I'm your host, Travis Ostrillo, and on today we have an excellent interview with my buddy, Joey Stuckey. So he is a, a songwriter, a song producer, a musician, and a touring artist as well. So he's been around the industry a long time, and he's got a lot of experiences to share in his uh, huh, long interview. So you get a little bit of pieces of every bit of the music business um, in this interview too. So such a, a well-spoken individual, such a such a guy who overcame a lot of obstacles and willing to share his experiences and how excited he is about what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have three segments as always on these interviews. The first segment, we get to know a little bit more about who Joey Stuckey is, about how he found music in his life, um, what he did with it, um, how he refined his craft, um, how he started writing songs, and also what it's like to be a professional musician or in the music, or music industry today and those little parts itself. So there's a lot of gold nuggets through this, not just as a musician or a guitarist or a songwriter, but just being in the industry as well. So that's why this interview went super long. He's just got a lot to say and a very interesting individual. So in segment two, we break down uh, three of his songs and each song is seven minutes. So there is a lot of contextual gold through, sprinkled throughout each and every, every song. And it's kind of why I like his songwriting because there's just a lot there that makes every single one of those more interesting. So check those out and take those little gold pieces, use them in your songwriting and your solos and your ability to uh, perform uh, with your friends as well. And then in segment three, as always, I have my students who ask Joey questions of what it's like to be a professional musician, what it's like to struggle learning guitar and what it's like to uh, work with other musicians as well. So speaking on that, this podcast is sponsored by Osterlo Guitar Academy. So are you struggling to learn guitar? Um, are you struggling to make the serious guitar gains that you're expecting to do so? Um, do you have a guitar collecting dust in the corner of your room, but you don't know um, the steps to really get started to learning how to play guitar efficiently? Or have you been playing for five to 10 years and just struggling to make the gains that you want in just learning a song every once in a while and not really improving and kind of staying stagnant? and are looking for a challenge, a way to make you better. So go to osterloguitaracademy.com, submit a message, and we'll get talking about how I can make you a better musician today. So I hope you guys enjoy this interview. I do understand it's long. So if you stick through it, you're going to get a lot out of it. So I hope you enjoy. Hey, guys. I'm here with Joey Stuckey, and let me tell you guys, he is awesome. He's got a wonderful voice, great musician, and I can't wait to get down with this interview with him. So, Joey, are you there? I am, my friend. Awesome, awesome, man. Cool. Well, thanks for coming here and joining us today. And Absolutely, my pleasure. We get to hang out for a little while. We get to answer some questions, and we get to talk music, my favorite thing. Me too. Awesome, man. So could you uh, give us a little bit of intro about yourself, Joey? Sure. Um, I think the most uh, relevant thing for everybody to know is uh, threefold. Uh, the first thing is I am a blind brain tumor survivor. Um, so I, uh, a lot of what I talk about, uh, you know, in music or in person, whether it's a master class or uh, inspirational talk or a concert, uh, is the, my sort of focus on living a life of intention. So that means that simply means a, a life that's of value to you and hopefully to your community. So that means a lot to me. Um, it, it, it has a lot to do with me in the sense that the way I learned music is uh, is very different than maybe most people. So not being able to see presents some challenges with that. And honestly, the brain tumor, I mean, being blind is not easy, but um, the, the brain tumor actually left me with a number of health challenges that I still have to manage today. Uh, so um, I happened when I was two years old. Um, and, you know, because of it later in life, it was successfully removed when I was two, but, uh, because of the damage it left, like, for example, I have a metal hip, I have a metal shoulder, 
Um, you know, I'm still pretty young. And, and so uh, they love, I'll say they love me at airports when I go through the metal detector. They just, <laughs> <I believe. laughs> Air, airport, you know, the TSA yes. people are not, the TSA people are not the happiest people anyway. No. Um, <laughs> and the fact and that they I, have to do anything, they're like, oh my well, God. Uh, it's so, I'm just, I'm so in fear of hearing the snap of a rubber glove. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> I say that almost kidding. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, and then um, another thing is I have never done anything except music. I've always been blessed to, to have a job in music. Now, I've had a lot of different jobs in music. I've worked as a journalist. I've been a, a media personality, a TV host, radio host. I've done a lot of article writing. Uh, I've taught uh, both privately and at universities. Um, and then, of course, I own a run, run a recording studio um, and I work as a producer. And so I do a lot of things like that. And then uh, the final thing that's really important to me is, is my work in education and, and learning as much about my craft as I possibly can and passing that on to other people, which is why I'm so excited about what you're doing with your podcast, because I think it's a brilliant way to learn. So that's really exciting for me. So, yeah, that's that's a that's a very quick snapshot. Oh, yeah. And that's a lot to say just within that snapshot. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of depth in there. But, yeah, like I love what you said. We are here to share our talents with everybody else that's why we were that's why we were giving them and that's what they're meant for right so i i envy that it sounds like you quite have quite the long lasting career very i would say depth and wide you know yeah, how they yeah. say you go deep into knowledge and wide to cover the broad strokes you kind of got both ways yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, the thing is, it hasn't always been easy to be in the music business. It's, it's, a, it's a weird business. Um, there's a high amount of delusion in the business, um, but uh, it, it, it is so rewarding um, to, to be able to create something that, that can impact someone in such a powerful way like music. I mean, music is the most <laughs> vibrant force for positive change that I know of. And so I, I just love being able to do it. Um, because I just think it's so powerful. It doesn't know any limits. It doesn't know any boundaries. It, it just, it just is this amazing thing. Oh yeah. It's like the unwritten communication. Yeah, like, absolutely. It, it's a beautiful, it, it's, it really is the most versatile tool of communication because, you know, and I'm sure you've had this experience. I've, I've had, I don't, I sadly, one of the few things I, I have regret in my life is that I never learned another language. Um, and so uh, there's reasons for that that I won't bore you with, but um, right. the, the, the fact is like, I can listen to uh, a record in French and not understand any of the words mm -hmm. and still be moved by it. And that's amazing. That it is. It's almost like opera to me because yeah. I can hardly understand what they're saying, but you can yeah. feel the emotion that they're extracting from it through the music. Absolutely. You know, and, and I'll tell you, there's there's uh, for anyone out there listening who hasn't delved into opera before. Uh, if you get a chance, you should really listen to some Puccini and you should you should go and look up the lyrics to some of these uh, operas. They're they're uh, some of them are very scandalous. And it's funny mm -hmm. to me that you a, a lot of times there's this there's this perception of like, you know, aristocratic old ladies listening to opera. And if, if they are listening to Puccini, um, they're a little twisted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the opera. His yeah. stuff's amazing from a musical standpoint, but some of the lyrics are a little strange. Anyway, just a little strange. From what <laughs> yeah, I understand, yeah. it's heavy drama based. So maybe oh, yeah. the Big scope time. to the opera has a lot of meaning there. So it, it's it honestly like some of the Puccini, like Tarantino is, mm -hmm. is one of them, is kind of like Fifty Shades of Grey for opera. That's all I'm gonna say. Ooh, so, okay, <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. It's, it's strange. <laughs> I don't know it, so I might have to do some digging myself. But yeah. I'm might I might be scared to find what you're talking about. Ooh. Yeah, it, it's not it's not horrifying, but it is it is surprising. <laughs> that is wild. That is wild. All right. Um, where do you go? Um, hold on, hold on. I'm just making sure I can read what I wrote. That's the first. Problem. <laughs> That's the first problem. Um, who were your influences growing up, and what was the first album you ever owned? Oh, this is a good question. So I am an eclectic soul. Uh, mm -hmm. I love it all. I love it, man. I love hip hop. I love heavy metal. I love opera, country, bluegrass, mm -hmm. jazz, rock, funk. I mean, you know, uh, whatever you, reggae, ska. I mean, I, there's, I haven't met a music form yet. Well, I will say I'm not a big polka fan. Uh, but um, 
right. it, does, it doesn't speak to me. But I, I love all kinds of music. So interestingly, mm -hmm. my parents always had music as part of our household. Um, and my dad played country music uh, in, a, in a band for a while. My mom uh, was very involved in the church and sang, you know, hymns and stuff like that because her father was a, a Baptist minister. Um, so there, there was always music going on in the house, but mm -hmm. my parents did an incredible job of you know, explaining the world to me and making sure that I, you know, knew about the world as much as I possibly could. Um, there, are, there are two glaring exceptions to their, their scope and breadth of what they taught me. One of them was until I was about 35 years old, I did not know that stop signs were octagons. Uh, Understood. Understood and the, why. Only, <laughs> the only reason, the only reason I know now is because Chris Rock in one of his comedy specials called the sign an octagon. I was like, wait, the stop signs an octagon. I was like, yeah. And I was like, well, my, when I had the Lego toys of mm -hmm. the police station, all the stop signs were around. So that's one that my parents missed. And the other one they missed, they taught me how to turn the radio up and down, mm -hmm. but they didn't teach me about the knob that changed the channel. So for my first six or seven years of life everything was like country or gospel or classical Got and it. then when i was about seven years old i was at school and i heard this music playing i was like man what is that and this kid's like it's rock and roll man and uh that was that so no, but but i'd have to say the, the the very first album i bought for myself mm -hmm. um my mom bought me some but the very first album i bought for myself and, and this dates me. I was a little kid, but I was like, way into music, even as a little child. Um, I bought uh, Def Leppard's Pyromania. And that's the first mm -hmm. record I bought for myself because one of my cousins had it and it brought it to the house. And I hadn't even heard it on radio yet. I don't know why. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. And, you know, I just rebought that record about a month ago mm -hmm. um, when Led Zeppelin, oh, not Led Zeppelin, what's wrong with me? When, when, um, when their record came out, when Def Leppard's new record came out. Um, and, and I rebought Pyromania and, you know, it holds up pretty well. It holds up pretty well. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's, it's still a great record. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that date it, you know, like some of the production things that were happening at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think it still sounds pretty good. And, and, you know, and I like Def Leppard. I'm not a huge fan, you know, but, but I mean, I love the Pyromania record. It still speaks to me. I still like it. But um, when it, when it, when we finally moved, that was when I was using cassettes. Uh, and a lot of your listeners probably won't know what that is, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember. Them. <laughs> yeah. But, but then, but then the, the next album that I bought for myself was when CDs came about. And we used to have a, a store close to where I lived when I was in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, it was called Hoyt Stereo. Mm -hmm. And they, they were so kind to me because they had a huge selection of new and used CDs. Mm -hmm. And they, because now I spent a lot of money with them, but they, they let me come in and my mom would read through all the titles to me. I mean, this, we'd spend like several hours there and she'd read through all the titles with me and I'd pick out 20 records that I thought sounded interesting that I hadn't heard. And then I'd go sit down and listen to the first song off each one in front of their massive like hi-fi stereo system. Yeah. And then I'd probably buy half of them. Plus I bought all my stereo equipment from them too. So they were always so sweet to me. Because it's this little blind kid coming in and saying, "I want to hear some new music. Let me hear something new. You know, tell me what's up." Yeah. So, but, but when that start, when that CDs came around, which I think at least I didn't know they were around until around 1987. Um, I don't know if they were. I think I think they had come in before that, but they weren't super popular because you know they used to cost about thirty bucks a disc mm -hmm. um, back in those days. Anyway. Um, I, I bought uh, the Beatles Hard Day Night was was the first CD I bought. And I also bought at the same time a record called Starflight One, which was uh, what, mm -hmm. what we used to call contemporary space music. But today you call it New Age. Yeah. And so uh, we, we bought that and I bought Starflight One, which was a New Age record, which was a fantastic record. So anyway, those were my first two um, CDs that I bought with my own money. But the first cassette, the first album I ever bought, I will say shortly around the same time as the pyromania purchase i bought uh, u2 war and mm -hmm. also mike and uh, michael jackson's thriller yeah all that all right kind of the same all same right. same genre so yeah I, I bought several but 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 um you know uh that's when i had an allowance because pr prior to that my parents just like my very first record that i was ever given was actually the beatles as well and it was the beatles yesterday and today which is a sort of a compilation 
uh, record. Mm-hmm. And my mom saw it and said, oh, I thought you might enjoy this and just sort of, you know, said, here, take this and go see what you think. And I, man, I wore that record out. <laughs> yeah. It, no kidding. Yeah. Dang. So the Beatles have been a huge influence on me. Um, and, 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 you know, my first entree into jazz was like Spyro Gyro. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and then I got, that's, I think anyone who hasn't listened to jazz before, I think Spyro Gyro is a good way to get in uh, because it, it still has a lot of pop sensibilities and they don't go crazy with all the different modal things and, you know, all the things they can, we can do musically. Um, so, but, but then I became a, a hard bop fan with like Coltrane mm-hmm. and Miles Davis. And, and, yeah. and I think, I think if you were to ask me, what, you know, two of the records that shaped my life, they weren't the first ones I bought, but two that actually shaped my life and influenced me a lot. Uh, I would say Nirvana's Nevermind, um, from a recording standpoint, totally flipped my switch and mm-hmm. really, really, you know, made me want to chase that sound as an engineer. And then uh, from a musical standpoint, from, from, from the sense of phrasing, uh, from a musical standpoint, Miles Davis kind of blue. Uh, was a real watershed moment for me because one of the things that he does better than everybody else, he plays a few wrong notes here and there, but one mm-hmm. of the things that he does better than anybody else is lets what he's played sink in. And I joke with my students a lot, telling them that I almost started smoking so I could play like Miles Davis because, <laughs> because every picture you see with him is like trumpet in one hand, cigarette in the other hand. And so when yeah. people are like, man, people like, so, so people say, Man, Miles is just letting you let you think about what he just plays. Like, no, he's taking a smoke break. He's just he's playing like three notes on the trumpet, and then he's going to take a puff on a cigarette. That's why there's a big pause. <laughs> uh, but I, I say that as a joke, but because he really is just his his again his sort of sense of phrasing is just genius. Anyway, I, I, I moved off to a few different rabbit holes there, but uh, but yeah, that's those are some of my earliest memories. But you asked about influences. I mean, I am influenced by musically i'm influenced by so much we could talk about a million different bands i mean oh, yeah. i'm a big smiths fan uh i love morrissey uh i'm a you know, big i'm from georgia so i'm a big rem fan i'm also from georgia so i'm a big almond brothers fan yeah. um uh, I'll, i may even be a bigger wet willie fan i don't know if people know who that is but I, uh, Jim, I, i'll be honest i don't know wet willie <laughs> yeah wet willie well they had they had a couple hits in the 70s but uh, my good friend Jimmy Hall was a singer for that band, also played saxophone and, and harmonica. And he's gone on to play with like Hank Williams Jr. and all these big blues bands and stuff. And he, he's, he's currently the singer for the Jeff Beck band. So um, he, he's fantastic. He's just a one of a kind musician. He, we've done some recordings together, some live performances and stuff. And he's just really great. So, I mean, everything from those real sort of Southern rock, you know, uh, blues oriented groups, you know, all the way to, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, like I said, John Coltrane and some of those guys. Um, so of course, Derek Trucks band's amazing. You know, and Tedeschi Trucks is really great. Uh, another band that I adore that just has a new record out is uh, uh, Humphreys McGee has a new record out. Yes. Right now. Yeah. I saw them live in Indianapolis. And oh, they're so blown great. away because that was the first time I ever seen them or any kind of jam band. Ever. And, and, and that's, and, you know, they, they were, just, they're just ridiculous. They're so good. They're so good. Um, so yeah, they're they're incredible. So yeah, man. I mean, I, I I could talk about so many different influences, but in my bio, I list two influences uh, for guitar, um, and, and I could go further, but but these are these are definitely there. Uh, you know, Wes Montgomery, who's a real jazz player, plays with his thumb, and then you know uh, Jeff Beck, who's a real technically proficient sort of rock player but mm-hmm. heck man i could i could mention eric johnson joe satrioni you know i could we could talk about it. i don't i don't think you can play guitar and not be influenced by hendrix i mean there's you know yeah, it's true uh, i mean even if it's even if you play different than he does like just from a tonal perspective just from like the sound that he gets and you mm-hmm. know the bin and i i think his best thing are the bins he gets his bins are amazing yeah um, you know he'll do some of those triple bins and it's just like so anyway yeah i mean you can't you can't not you know, think Hendrix is, is amazing. So um, anyway, we could go on forever. <laughs> no, for sure. And like Hendrix, from what I understood, Hendrix was like an amalgamation of two different artists, one bluesy and I forget the other one. And he mixed the two together to create his own sound. <clears throat> yeah, you know, he, he did. I'll, I'll tell you, there's a weird I live in Macon, Georgia now. Mm-hmm. And I'm the official music ambassador for my hometown. <laughs> and Clearly. and and it, yeah it's, it's it's an interesting thing but um we have a tie to Jimi hendrix from from here because he played guitar for a famous make a night little richard 
So Hendricks started off backing up Little Richard, and then eventually, you know, because what he wanted from music was radically different than that, he went off and did his own thing. And, you know, it wasn't until he went to the UK and formed a band there and started succeeding there that he came back to the States and really made a big name for himself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he started off, he started off playing for Little Richard. Oh, so, you know, okay. he certainly has a lot of that R&B, mm -hmm. you know, background. No, that's for sure. I, I've listened to bits and pieces. I got to be honest. I was raised like listening to 2000s and like 90s and then sure. moving on forward. And yeah. you haven't gone in reverse to the old stuff and dug some of that good stuff up besides like Metallica and all the metal that I was super into. Oh yeah, Metallica is fantastic. I, I, we were just talking about this before you started the, the interview. The, the Black Album is one of my favorite records of theirs. Um, and now, now you have to understand a lot of people, a lot of Metallica fans may not like that album, uh, yeah. but the, but the, <laughs> the reason the reason that it really means a lot to me, yeah, is because well, there's two reasons. Mm -hmm. Sonically, because I'm a recording engineer for a living, sonically it's one of their best sounding records. Um, just just mm -hmm. from a sonic recording standpoint like the drums sound massive mm -hmm. i mean you know everything is very articulate and clear and clean and it's the best vocals that hetfield has done in my opinion because because their producer was just like relentless yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were, you know it was just, a lot just, yeah i mean, I mean they, they spent like a million dollars on that record uh which is nuts that is um, crazy so, the time yeah i mean that's so i mean they just they did it again and again and again and again and so it was perfect. And look, I love Ride the Lightning. Mm -hmm. I love Kill Em All. I love Justice for All. I mean, all the records, I, you know, I like a lot of their albums. But anyway, the point is, I, that one really speaks to me specifically, oh, yeah. not just because from a vocal standpoint, I think it's Hetfield's best work. And also mm -hmm. uh, from a recording standpoint, I really like it. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more that it was so well done and so well produced. And yeah. I appreciate the songs on it for sure but if i had to give like my metallica favorite i guess this is just going to be a thing now is we're just, <laughs> we're just going to debate the yeah, best yeah. metallica album at the start of every show now yeah but there you go <laughs> mine has been injustice for all because i love I, the balance i can't, I can't I, blame you That's i a good love record. the structures i love how long they are it takes you for a ride it repeats the stuff and it's oh man like it's, it's a fantastic so record no doubt you're, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, it, it's a fantastic record. Um, it, it's just that that Black Album, again, because I was really young at the time it came out, um, it, like I said, It and Nevermind were two of the most sonically perfect records I'd ever heard. And it really shaped me as a recording engineer. I just really, you know, I really was like, man, I want that sound. Uh, and, and, and over my career, and I think this is important for students to, to think about, over my career, what I really learned is I want to be able to get all the sounds. I want to be able to get the right sound for the right recording. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I'm doing a jazz record, the Metallica sounds not the right call. If I'm doing a, if I'm doing a rock That's record, good. the country sounds not the right call. So you want to learn, you want to kind of learn, you know, all the different tricks. Like, okay, if I want a big, if I want really big drums, I go this way. If I want the drums to sound, you know, thinner, uh, I, I go this way. You know, different, different things like that. So yeah, but I, everything can be instructive if you let it. But yeah, you're you're right. That's a great record. I, I can't I can't say I can't tell you it's not because that's a good record. Hands down. Um, I shared before the show about my oopsie first playing, so I'm going to share my first album. Um, the first album I owned that I don't claim to own was the Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've all made some some questionable purchases in the past. Um, do you know, yeah. I'm not ashamed to tell you, uh, this would probably be embarrassing to most people, but I'm not ashamed to tell you one of my guilty pleasures is, is, uh, is Rick Astley. Um, oh, no kidding. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I love to be Rick Roll. I, oh, I don't you love it? Wow. I love it. I love it. <laughs> we go and sing it at karaoke as a meme every time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, you know, he, he's got some good yeah. stuff and, and, uh, and it's really good. I don't know if you saw, um, on YouTube. Uh, he actually did a, a song with Foo Fighters at, at a concert. Have you seen that? No, I have not. It, Google it, man. It's it's pretty funny. And uh, uh, I think they, if I remember correctly, um, they actually did one of his songs. Um, and I, I, it's been it's been a couple of years since I've seen that clip, but it was pretty funny. But yeah, I there's there's some music out there that 
that in serious musical circles, people might question my taste, but I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> real, real quick, that was Rick Ash Ashley Ashley, right? Yeah, yeah, Rick Ashley, yeah. With and Foo Fighters. And Foo Fighters. Yeah. Who is another incredible band? God, they're they're awesome. Oh yeah, they are. Yeah. I and saw we, I've we, seen we them the seen them live. Like that. Oh, have you? Yeah. yeah, they were great. How was how was the vibe of the crowd at that? It was awesome. It was awesome. Everybody had such a good time. Uh, it was in uh, the old Braves Stadium here in, in Georgia. And there was probably, I'm guessing, I'm having to guess, but I'd say there's about 40,000 people there. Mm-hmm. So everybody had a blast. And uh, and Dave was just awesome. And, and he did something that we all wanted. Uh, and that was he played a song on the drum kit. Oh, and yes. <laughs> so I, was very, I was very happy about that. Um, and uh, d- d- so it was it was a, it was a good time. That was about, oh, two or three years ago, I guess, um, or maybe maybe four years ago. I think, you know what, now that I think about it, I think it was like 2019 when we saw them. Um, but they were fantastic. No, that is awesome, man. I just went to uh, a Bowling for Soup Less Than Jake concert. Oh, nice. Weekend. And I remember Bowling for Soup like 10 years ago, went to my college. And I remember listening to them when I was just a kid yeah <laughs> and they're the same same kind of vibe same kind of uh show that they did 10 years ago yeah and, and they're they're all old now <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> weird to see old dudes playing punk music but hey i supported it it's all right absolutely absolutely, absolutely. It, it is that is kind of funny you know it is funny that like some genres like you some genres are more difficult to age in mm. uh and it's true that's there's there's a there's an inherent risk uh, when you start telling you, telling people how old you are. Sometimes they either think you're too young not to, to know anything, or you're too old to, to keep up. Oh, yeah. So uh, the music business, I should say, the entertainment business in general is a bit ageist at times, and, and some genres are worse than others. But yeah, I can see you know Paul McCartney. We saw him in 2017, and, and it was a fantastic one of the best shows I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. And and I never thought I would hear the voice that used to come out of my little turntable in my bedroom when I was a kid singing some of the Beatles songs that I loved so much and he he played for three hours and and, and he just and he was just a dynamo and uh, and there was a good hundred thousand people at that show and he was charming and, and nice and mm-hmm. played his butt off and uh, it was really an incredible show but you know he he doesn't age like he's no. still like you know it works for him but you know if you were doing heavy metal or punk rock it it gets of course i say yeah. that and then gene simmons is like in his 70s from kiss so <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> i mean as long as you can physically go out there and do it like yeah i don't, I don't think it dies i think the imagery of it's what odd. genre you are in gets yeah. a little questionable especially yeah. when you're targeting like the six the teenage years and the early the adult years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As, for a certain generation and then you're still playing those things because people are a little bit nostalgic well right and you know the other thing is too like if you're if you're this i mean in pop music it's really hard to to age well Mm -hmm. um you know if you're if you're if you're britney spears doing that kind of music Mm -hmm. you're you're supposed to be young and gorgeous i mean that's just kind of Mm -hmm. you, you know what people so it gets harder the older you get that's why you see some of these pop stars move away into other genres that are sort of adjacent to pop because mm-hmm. pop by and large is sort of a young person's game. Um, but, mm-hmm. but, you know, but there are artists that have managed to reinvent themselves and, and just keep on going. That's why like what, what I play, which is, which is, I call my music. Well, I have, I have two different bands that I run. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're both just my name, but one is my jazz project, which is traditional jazz or fusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other is more of a, a blues based rock based uh, stuff. And so um, I broadly let, I've made up a genre to encompass that. Uh, it's totally made up, but then again, mm-hmm. all genres are. Uh, and I call it progressive Americana, which okay. are which are <laughs> Americana, as you may or may not know, is a huge umbrella. Mm-hmm. Lots of got things fall in Americana and then progressive, you know, meaning that it's got jazz and sort of rock tendencies as well. So. So, but we just kind of do what we do. And I do brand, I brand each tour and each record more narrowly, but I, I brand myself more broadly. And that's, it's a challenge. I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. if I would narrow my focus, I would make more money, uh, but I just, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, so, 
So right, I don't. Well, <laughs> I mean, if if we think about it a little bit, I look at one of my favorite bands, Alter Bridge, which in the grand scheme, oh, yeah. some of the musicians you've mentioned haven't been around as long as some of the greats that you've mentioned before. Right. But as I've listened to the evolution of their albums, there's there's that point where they're trying to be different enough not to sound the same right and it doesn't necessarily hit you the same way right because something about it is different enough to throw it off right right you're and right you don't fall and you don't fall off as a listener as long as they're trying something new it just might not be your favorite either but sometimes right. they go yeah. in that direction and you absolutely love it and it's like this is a side i've never seen before this is right. so great where has this been it's just an evolution of it whether you like it the preference or not well i think you made a key point there with the word evolution i mean you have to evolve as an artist uh if you don't you know you're gonna have you're gonna have problems with longevity and the other thing is you know um the fact is everyone's gonna have their peak everyone's gonna have their heyday where they were the biggest band in the world mm. um but but that doesn't last forever and so um you know you have to understand that that everything has a time and everything has a, a season and you just, you know, things will wax and wane. So, you know, uh, but but your 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 dedicated fans, you know, are going to be there through the long haul. And, you know, I don't know how many people listening to this are contemplating a serious career in music, mm -hmm. but from a educational standpoint, you know, the, the old I'll just say this and we can move on to a different topic, but I'll just say that the old axiom was uh, I've sold my record to 5,000 people mm -hmm. and now I've got to find 5,000 new people to sell my record to. <laughs> yeah. Well, in reality, mm -hmm. with the way the internet has, the internet has done a lot of good things. It's done a lot of bad things. So one of the good things is you can have direct communication with your fans mm -hmm. and, and you can ask them, Hey, what do you want? Do you, do you want us? So for example, we did, we pressed vinyl records for one of our albums mm -hmm. and I reached out to the fan base and said, Hey, if we press vinyl, would you guys buy it? Do, do you want mm -hmm. vinyl? Turns out they did want vinyl. I was amazed at how many vinyl records we sold on tour. Uh, I, I, we didn't take a whole bunch because they take up a lot of space. We took, we mm -hmm. took a crate of vinyl records and we took two crates of CDs and two crates of t-shirts, mm -hmm. but we had, but, but anyway, we, we, we sold, I probably like eighty five percent of the vinyl on tour. I was amazed. Damn. Um, and, and and so and and so. Uh, but the thing is, mm -hmm. um, the 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 key though is what what really you should do is yes, you have to reach out and make new fans. You have to break new ground. You have mm -hmm. to you know conquer new domains, if you will. But the real way now to make a living is to reach back out to those dedicated loyal fans and get money from them again. And the way you do that is you say, you say to them, Hey, what do you guys want? What's the next thing you'd like to see us do? Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're literally asking the fan base, what do you want to buy? And then they tell you, mm -hmm. and then you produce that and you can have a successful career that way. So it has changed a lot because the old maxim of, you know, I've made, I've sold 5,000 records. Now I've got to make 5,000 new fans. So mm -hmm. I can sell 5,000 more. Yes. You have to continue growing in your fan base, but mm -hmm. you don't have to do that. Anyway. That's understood. Yeah. Um, I I could go off on in this direction <laughs> too. It's it's. I mean, I'm not in it as professionally as you are, but from what I've heard, like interview wise from Seven Dust, um, Clint talked about how metal's not dead. At least, oh no, at least that version of metal isn't. It's right. just the ones who aren't great won't last. That's right. Those will fall out. And I, I think, think that's, that's I think what's that's beautiful true. about the about the internet and the easy access is that the great ones stay, yeah, and the other ones go. And yeah, honestly, that's how it should be. I agree. Let the marketplace decide. I mean, the the, the good news though for for those people who are in a small niche market or they think, well, my music's not going to sell well or mm -hmm. nobody else will like this. I promise you, if you like it, somebody else will like it. Does that mean that you'll fill eighty thousand seat arenas? No. Does that mean you'll have a platinum album? No, but it does mean that you can have a reasonable career in the music business and a career that's worth having. You know, even if you sell 10,000 records a year, 
you got you got lots of different resources you can employ as an independent musician mm -hmm. to have a career that is fruitful and th that gives you the what you need to support yourself and your family and, and also gives you what you need as an artist mm -hmm. because the reason we do this is because we feel or at least the reason i do it is because i feel compelled to create if i'm not making music i'm miserable and so i kind of have to do it it's it, the music business is one of those things like if you could choosing to be in it for me wasn't an option mm -hmm. like if, if from a logical standpoint like like i would say run run away <laughs> run away from music business from a logical standpoint but yes. but but that's but that's just when you're at the beginning it feels that way once you learn how to navigate the music business and you learn mm -hmm. what to do and what not to do you realize that you can carve out a career on your own terms now you know every choice has a consequence so like i said earlier i choose not to be narrowly focused that I'm not stupid. That hurts me when it comes to selling a million records. Mm -hmm. I'll never sell a million records. That's not, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm making music that I want and I'm making music that other people enjoy and it's paying me enough that I can do it full time and, and have a lifestyle that I, that I like. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, there's, there are, there are trade-offs, but yeah. So, you know, I'm, I feel compelled to do it. And I think that's, I think that's the beautiful thing about the internet, you know, that you're, you know, at the beginning, it's kind of a problem because so many people are doing it and there's so much music out there and you wonder how will I ever stand out from the noise? Um, and there's a strategy behind that. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the other side, the, the good side is, as you mentioned, that's the negative side. The good side is, as you mentioned, the marketplace decides what has value. Yep. And, and, you know, and, and, and so the stuff that really shouldn't be heard eventually isn't. <laughs> yeah. so, and then you know. that will fall off, which is yeah. fine. It's yeah. a big misconception, but Hey, this, this way you got more avenues of revenue. It's a lifestyle. It's a possibility to be a professional musician for those who have that old school mindset of we need to find a record deal and go play a bunch of gigs. And that's the, yeah. one. like, that's that. Would you say that's that eighties, nineties mentality of professional? Yeah. I mean, so, so, I mean, you know, if, if your goal is to be Adele, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, or Michael Jackson or, mm -hmm. you know, someone that's huge, that's worldwide, just massively popular and you're selling out these big arenas, mm -hmm. then you have to go and play everywhere you can play, whether they pay you or not. You just have to go out and just make people take notice. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a record label. Have to, have to, have to. Mm -hmm. And you have to have one of the major three record labels. There's only three majors left. You've got Sony, we yep. got Warner Brothers, yep. and you got Universal Music Group. That's it. Those are the big mm -hmm. three. And, and, the, and they control 85% of the music business. Mm -hmm. But that other 15%, mm -hmm. if you're like myself, um, you know, I have, I have my own label mm -hmm. and I have my own, I have a management firm that, that, that works with me and I do some other things. So I've, my, I've created a team of people to, to fulfill those label functions and the good thing about that is, yes, I'm selling fewer records. I'm not as, as big a platform, but I'm doing things my way. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a, as a brain tumor survivor and a blind person, there are certain things that I have to do for my health that I, you know, would be harder on a, on a major label where they expected me to tour 300 days out of the year. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I just I, I can't do that. And unfortunately for me, I have lots of other sources of income. Like I said, as a music journalist, as an educator, mm -hmm. um, I run a studio, I'm a producer. So I can do all these other things that give me all the tools I want. And I have a wonderful, very vibrant, you know, eclectic existence. So I do lots Definitely. of different things. Every, I, and I get, I'm a restless spirit. I'll admit it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a restless spirit. I get restless when I don't have lots of different projects in the air. Oh, so I, I love that. it. A man <laughs> love that it. wants to keep his hands busy absolutely For sure i'll get in trouble otherwise <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm the same way so now that we'll go on to question three <laughs> <laughs> man um how did your early experience with learning guitar go yeah so that was tricky so mm -hmm. it's a beautiful story actually um the my dad always played guitar so it was always around the house but honestly in my early years it was a fight for survival uh, I was so sick and had so many problems that were caused by the brain tumor. Just going to school and just being healthy was all I could manage. Mm -hmm. So I never really thought about playing a musical instrument as a kid. 
Um, but I loved music. I was addicted to music. It was a big mm-hmm. part of my life. It was a big part of keeping me feeling happy and positive too, even when I was really sick. So then um, about when I was about 17 years old, um, I decided I wanted to take guitar lessons. And, and the way that happened was I started fooling around with recording equipment when I was about 13. Mm-hmm. And my parents indulged me and bought me some very cheap equipment. And I used the scientific method. I was like, hey, what? Yeah. What, what happens if I plug this in over here? What if I put this mic over here? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? Uh-huh. And I just played with it until I sort of learned like what, what worked and what didn't work. Uh-huh. And then by the time I was 15, I had my first uh, job as a sound technician at the local planetarium. And from uh-huh. that, a lot of the people that worked there that were, uh, you know, 18 to 21, that kind of range, uh-huh. had garage bands. And they said hey we understand you have some recording equipment can you record my band's demo i'm like yeah sure mm-hmm. and that's how the studio business was born basically and so then from that you know most of the bands were coming in playing all these cover songs you know they weren't playing original material yeah and mm-hmm. so one day a band came in and they played this song i was like man that's a really great song mm-hmm. i have a bit of an encyclopedic knowledge of music and i don't know that artist who who wrote that and they're like, oh, that's that's our song. We wrote that. And that's when I kind of had that watershed moment where I said, oh, man, I I want to I want to write and play. I want to write and play music. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I started taking guitar lessons. And so my mom uh, looked up a guitar teacher in town and said, uh, my son's blind and interested in getting guitar lessons. And uh, and, and he, she said, have you ever taught a, a blind person? Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, I haven't. He said, but let me think about it. Mm -hmm. And I'll figure out how and we'll do it. He said, give me two weeks to think about it. And he said, within that time, I'll come up with a lesson plan and how to do it. Mm -hmm. And and we'll do it. And he became one of my dearest friends of all time. I I love him. He's family to me. Uh, His Mm -hmm. name's Terry. And uh, Terry taught me classical guitar is what we learned Mm -hmm. for the lessons. But so all my technique comes from classical Classical, pedagogy. I got Um, you. I got you. But... Uh, we also, but I played, but after when, when lessons were over, we played rock and roll, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so, so he taught me a lot of stuff. And every once in a while, when I come up against something I couldn't learn mm-hmm. by ear, I'd say, Terry, I've been working on this song. I just can't figure out what this chord is. You know, um, he'd help me with stuff like that. He was, mm-hmm. he was very sweet and wonderful, but yeah, he did some amazing things, but basically my guitar training uh, was things like really knowing the neck of my instrument. So, mm-hmm. you know, saying to yourself, hey, the third fret on the fifth string is C, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the 12th fret on the sixth string is E, what, mm-hmm. whatever it is, the, the, you know, the fourth fret on the first string is G sharp, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. So just knowing where all the notes were was a big, big part of it. Figuring out how to do really correct fingering using all four fingers mm-hmm. uh, on the left hand and really, really learning how to, if I didn't know a chord or if I wanted to harmonize something specifically to really know, you know, like how to do that and not only how to do it, but how to finger it correctly. So it was the most economy of motion. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. mm-hmm. And then he did something really remarkable, which was he, he taught me what the notes looked like, even though I can't read sheet music because I can't see it. I know uh. what it looks like on the page. He took a box of sand and drew in it. And said, here's what the quarter note looks like. Here's what the staff looks like. And here's what a treble clef looks like. And so he he showed me all that stuff so that I could describe it to a sighted person if I mm, needed to. Yeah. And they could I could say, hey, what does this shape look like? And they go, it looks like that. So so you know, that was that was a hard way of doing it, but but it it it, it gave me knowledge so I could at least mm. communicate well. And then the other thing he did that was genius was he started teaching me college level music theory. And yeah. when I went to college mm. for music we had a terrible teacher <laughs> in, 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 the, in the theory department mm-hmm. and the entire um, the entire sophomore class was failing. Uh, and so there was mm-hmm. one girl in the class and myself that had AIDS. And the reason we had AIDS is that we'd already learned the music theory from our teachers. Mm-hmm. I think, I can't remember what she played. I want to say she played flute, but I may be wrong about that. But anyway, she, mm-hmm. uh, that was a long time ago, but she, uh, <laughs> She, she, she and I were the only people that had A's. Everybody else had like C's and B's because he was just a bad teacher. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, 
my point though is not to focus on that, but to focus on the fact that he taught me, you know, all the information I needed. And then in college, we got into more esoteric stuff like Pythagorean mm-hmm. theorem and all that kind of stuff, and writing what's called figure base and all this good stuff, which is okay for what for what I do every day is completely useless. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, <laughs> you know, but but that's that's kind of how my early days started in music. Okay, I got you. I got you. Um, we'll we'll make these like quick little bits. Um, what what kind of struggles? I mean, besides the fact of being blind and right. trying to visualize the fretboard itself, what kind of struggle uh, left you the most frustrated early on? Probably, well, I think one of the hardest things for anybody to learn at first is bar chords. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, it's not comfortable until you get used right. to it. It mm-hmm. hurts. And so that was a real, when I first, now we're talking about when I first started, mm-hmm. that was a real problem. Um, but, you know, I just persevered and kept doing it until I got it. And then, mm-hmm. and then uh, the other thing was um, my, uh, you know, when you first start, your fourth finger is really weak. Oh, yeah. Big time. And so, so I actually, my teacher gave me some exercises to do just to strengthen that fourth finger. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those were, those were, I think the two biggest challenges for me, um, with, with, with the guitar, you know, at, at, at first I've always had a mm-hmm. good ear and I've always had a good sense of, of timing. Um, mm-hmm. so, so that stuff wasn't hard, but, um, you know, it was, it was, it was at the beginning, those are the two real big struggles. So anyone that's mm-hmm. going through those, it's normal. Don't mm-hmm. worry about it. Just keep at it. I sure. will, I will end this question with this. I mm-hmm. believe in something called kinesthetics, which is basically just a fancy college word for muscle memory. Mm-hmm. And I think that when it comes to the basic technical skills you need to play your instrument, practicing those several times a day, short practice periods are better than long grueling practice periods. Now sure. there are times you're going to need to practice long, grueling practice periods. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are certain things like learning a new song and getting that form memorized. That requires more practice. But the basic scale practice, arpeggio practice, pull-offs and slurs and hammers-ons and all those kind Mm -hmm. of things that you practice, your your circular picking, you know, whatever whatever you want to do, sweet picking, you know, all these different Mm -hmm. things. You know, you you can work on the technique for those in short, practice periods several times a day mm-hmm. and i think that works at least for me that works better well you know what's interesting about this is did you ever hear of a thing called myelin like your muscle memory not. myelin uh-uh. it, basically it's your neuro cord on how well you have emotion memorized hmm. so the more that you continue to fire that thing correctly where your brain has to think about it, it builds a stronger chord to where you don't have to think about it and you play it consistently right every time. Beautiful. So by you having to do it a couple times over the course of the day and coming back to it because you have to forget it, do it again, forget it, do it again, forget it, do it again. Right. You're strengthening that myelin cord really fast versus trying to do 20 100 repetitions all at once exactly yeah i mean that that's exactly i I didn't know it was called that but that's exactly what i was talking about so that works a lot better for me just that kinesthetic building of that muscle memory is is really key because at the end of the day you want to clear your mind of all the technical stuff so you can just be a vessel for communication and that's really you know as a musician whether you're playing no matter what you're playing you know it it, that's a really important thing because you don't want to have to be thinking okay let's you know third finger does this and then you don't want to have to be thinking that kind of stuff yeah you know you just want you just want to do your thing exactly you just want to go out there and play like there was i think before i went and took lessons i would just rip backing track rip once i knew my scales and then i'd i kick myself because i didn't get any better because i was just (laughs) just jamming to have fun right you don't get better from just having fun you have to have structured time that is focused even though it might suck and then you schedule that time of okay i had 30 minutes 45 minutes of like structured practice here's 15 to 30 minutes of like here i'm just gonna have fun i'm gonna do what i want to do i'm gonna learn whatever song that i got going on that's right jam over whatever backing track i'm gonna do 
some ridiculous stuff, whatever makes me laugh and enjoy it at the same time. Yeah. Because it's, it's a balance. And if you just heavy one side, you're going to hate it. And then well, if you I love heavy the you other side, structure. you're going to get better. Yeah, I love that you say structure because it is important to have, you know, because because there are guys, you, you hear these apocryphal stories about the greats. Mm -hmm. um, people like Segovia for classical guitar or Charlie Parker for saxophone. And they, it's like these guys practice or even they they said it about uh, Stephen Ray Vaughan, too, mm -hmm. uh, that, that they practice 16 hours a day. That's nuts. Um, I, sure. I have a life. I can't practice 16 hours a day. And I know me. All that would do for me is give me carpal tunnel. I mean, <laughs> like, like that's I, I know the kind of luck that I have when it comes yeah. to stuff like that. So, so, but I mean, so yeah, that focus practice time, mm -hmm. it, you can you can get that same kind of benefit from a fro very focused practice Ooh. session. So, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. It is. It it goes a long way for balance for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, second sub question on that: What did you wish you knew sooner? I think, I think the thing that I wish I had known sooner um, probably is, well, two, twofold. Um, one, of, one thing is I, I wish that I had known, I, well, I, I guess I wish I'd started playing a lot younger. Mm -hmm. um, I wish does. I had, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish I'd started playing when I was like four and, you know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that that's, you know, that's kind of the, the thing. And with with music and like with music education, I wish that I had played like paid serious attention in my piano classes because mm -hmm. I, I had a, when I was in college the first time um, I really had uh, a lot on my plate and mm -hmm. I had uh, I had I was still running. I was, I was, you know, I was 20 years old and I was. Mm -hmm. I was in college, but I was also running a studio and playing in my band and doing all this stuff. And uh, I, you know, I started getting paid to record people by the time I was 18 years old. So, yeah, I, I've been working that gig for a while, yeah. and I had sax players to date, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, so I, I had a lot to do. So, you know, I wish I'd paid better attention to my piano classes, mm -hmm. but I honestly did the bare minimum I could to get a decent grade and get out. Um, because I, you know, you can't make everything a priority. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but that being said my piano skills are are low side of adequate and i wish they were more high side of adequate <laughs> mm -hmm. understood like where yeah. it's somewhat proficient but yeah yeah like right now I can, yeah yeah like mm -hmm. like in the studio i can kind of cheat when i'm playing piano yeah. um and and do some studio tricks that allow me to compensate for my deficiency mm -hmm. um but but like live you don't want to hear it i don't want to hear it mm -hmm. i mean it you know um, so, so yeah, but, but the other thing is, I, I think I wish I had known earlier how to give myself grace in music mm -hmm. and, and, and to say, you know, I, I've always been, I've always been like, I can be better. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's true. It's not that that's untrue. Um, I still don't think I've reached my maximum potential, but you have to, you used a beautiful word earlier, balance. You have to balance that desire to be the absolutely like best musician in the whole wide world mm -hmm. with other things and you don't become eric johnson or you know some of these just earth-shattering geniuses without making a lot of sacrifices and mm -hmm. so you have to make you have to make time sacrifices you say well do i spend time with my wife or do i go practice mm -hmm. um so you have to be reasonable about it uh that's why that idea of setting aside specific focus practice time is so important and man put it on your if you've got a calendar i mean mm -hmm. i live by my yeah. calendar put it on your calendar so you say hey friday at 3 p.m i'm gonna do 40 minutes of what you know yeah. uh so, so i mean that so i wish i had known i wish i'd known though how to be like how to, how not to be so hard on myself because that's extremely frustrating and really doesn't help me you know mm. that's not that's not to give just i'm not saying give yourself excuses not to succeed that's that's a different thing Mm -hmm. But but understand that, you know, you know, you you will get to where you want to go if you dedicate yourself to it. It's not going to happen overnight. I am not a mm -hmm. patient person. I work on being patient every day, yes. but I'm patient with other people. I'm not patient with myself. And so I wish I'd had more clarity about how to be patient with myself in the early days because it saved a lot of heartache. 
<laughs> that's a that's a young person problem too because I, it is man we it we is. all struggled with it we all did yeah we just yeah, wanted, we wanted the result now and like why yes. do i gotta wait yeah why do i have to wait i want it now exactly exactly so um would you say this is kind of a conception misconception question would you say guitar tone is in the hands or the equipment over your <laughs> time? oh this is a beautiful question yes, all right so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that by telling you uh two stories that are brief mm -hmm. the first one is i was playing a gig one night at a club and this guy came up out of the audience when we took a break and said hey man where's all your stuff i was like what do you mean he's like well where's all your racks of pedals and everything i was like i don't have all that i have a i have an amp i've got a wah pedal and i have my guitar that's all i got he's like you mean you're not doing compression and eq and blah 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 no man i He's like, how are you getting all that tone? I was like, uh, my hands. <laughs> and uh, yes. that was that was a thrill for me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it it does come down to mm -hmm. the player. But that being mm -hmm. said, I have about twenty five different amps, fifty different guitars, mm -hmm. and probably three hundred different pedals. <laughs> and and so I. I use those appropriately. So the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is you might not be able to get a specific tone you're going for without the specific amp and the specific guitar and the specific mm -hmm. pickup. And the, so I understand I, I'm always, I get a sound that I like and then I'm like, how can I make it better? Right. Yeah. How can I, but, mm -hmm. but because I'm a session musician, you know, one day I'm playing country, the next day I'm playing jazz, mm -hmm. the next day I'm playing something, you know, else. So, so, you know, I'm always having to be very resourceful and I try to create unique tones that are a signature for the artist or a signature for myself. Mm -hmm. That's not just a replication of Hendrix's tone or Van Halen's tone or, you know, Kurt Hamlin's tone, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. like, so, so, good. so, so, I mean, it's just like, you know, so, so I think, I think it honestly comes down to a, a, a balance of both, but if you're, mm -hmm. if you're, if your touch isn't right, nothing else will be right. Oh, exactly. So I try to tell my students, especially early on, because I get a lot of beginners or intermediates, they have one, two guitars. And before I even give them the Sweetwater magazine, <laughs> I'm like, my this favorite is, store. This is, yes, my favorite store. Well, freaking right there with Guitar Center. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I hand them the most dangerous piece of literature out there, I tell them <laughs> this I'm like, you need one amp, you need one distortion pedal. You need one reverb and one delay and one wall. Yeah. Start there and then craft your tone from there. Add pieces later on. If you go down this rabbit hole of just what about this one or this one or this one or this one, you're never going to get to the place of where you're playing. You can get great tone just out of one of each. Oh, God, you're, you're right. And, and the thing is, that's it. you need to learn to how to keep them use going. What you got. Yeah. 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 And, you need to learn how to use the and over time, you'll say, you know, I really need these kind of strings, this kind of pickup, this kind of guitar, mm -hmm. this kind of amp to get this tone yeah. uh, that I that I want. And you know, the kind of tone you can bring out of each instrument depends on the player too. So mm -hmm. you know, it, it may the, the same. Even if you went out and bought everything that Jimi Hendrix had in his rig, you yeah. might not be able to create that same tone mm -hmm. because he's he's a different person than you are. So you start, you know. But I always say. You know, start copying the greats and then learn how to speak the, the musical language and, and and add your own your own spin to all that. So, yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I agree. I think I think at, in the end of the at the end of the day, it's the player, not the gear. Oh, yeah. Hands down. Because I've, I've seen some guys with gear that's just like, oh, my God, you're getting this sound out of this. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the you sound know. that's coming out. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, me. it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, you know, here, here you're talking, but you're talking to a guy who spends, you know, yeah. regularly spends you know, three and $4,000 on one microphone. So, mm -hmm. you know, but, but again, my, for me, it's mm -hmm. slightly different because I'm crafting, I'm, I'm capturing, I'm capturing a ton of different people mm -hmm. and a ton of different styles with lots of different instruments. I'm trying to capture the essence of the artist. Yeah. So I have lots of different tools so I can always fine tune. It's kind of like being a painter, you know, having mm -hmm. all these different microphones. is like, you know, you, you have to have different paint brushes. You have different colors mm -hmm. of paint. You have all these different things. So, you know, it does take that. But I think at the end of the day, you should be able to take one amp and one guitar and make something good happen. Oh, yeah. 
you should be able to at bare minimum do that before you go tone chasing. Oh, hell yeah. Absolutely. 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 That's what I try to tell my students all the time. Keep it simple as possible. And then you can go down that rabbit hole when you're ready. And once, and once you have really milked everything you can out of that simple setup, and you're like, man, I just can't get anything better out of this. I have worked for a year with this thing and I've done, every, I've just, I've played with every single combination. I need this new piece of oh, fine. Mm-hmm. But you'd be amazed at the great recordings I've got with some gear that was terrible. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'd be amazed. Yeah. And it's a surprise. That's why you got to get good at using the tool before yeah. you get more expensive tools and treat it as a reward process more than it is just an acquisition process. Absolutely. So next question going into here is how did you gain your first experience playing live? And did you find it hard to uh, find people to play with? Yeah. So that's a great question. So Mm -hmm. um, I had a bit of an issue. So to to give you the full story, I graduated from high school when I was 14. Mm -hmm. I took a year off at 15 and we also moved to a new town. Mm -hmm. And then at 16, I started college, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do yet. So I just took like a couple of classes. I didn't go full time and I kind of played around. I, I took some history classes and ended up getting a minor in history and mm-hmm. some different things like that. But, but I had, I had a hard time kind of meeting people as a, as a, as a kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, especially since I can't drive, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to meet people. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult as a blind person to walk up to somebody and introduce yourself, you know, cold, it's kind of tricky. Yeah. Uh, especially now, nowadays it's not a problem because I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am, but, but as a teenager, it was, it was harder. Um, mm-hmm. So the wonderful guitar teacher I told you about earlier said to me one day, he said, uh, he called me Joseph and uh, he's like, Joseph, you need, mm-hmm. you need to get out more. Okay. <laughs> he's like, uh, right. he's like, he's like, I got some students that want to form a band. So you're playing with them. I'm like, okay. And he's like, uh, you're going to play bass. I'm like, Terry, I don't, I don't know anything about playing bass. Like, you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> and then and, looking at it now, you're like, yeah, that's, that's, that's easy. Bring yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I play bass. All, I play bass every day of the week now. So, so, uh, but anyway, he, he said, you'll, you'll get yeah. out there. So my first band was a group of his students. And, and so in, in that regard, it was pretty easy to find people to play with. But the challenge was, I didn't, everybody was not serious about it i was very serious mm. about it i i was like you know a couple of guys did it as a hobby yeah. but i was like i'm gonna be i'm gonna be a musician mm. i'm gonna be you know when, when i was you know 17 18 years old i'm like man this is what i want to dedicate my life to i knew and i said so so i was so the, the hard part wasn't really find people to play with but it was hard it was hard to find people that took it as seriously as i did and, and and you know True. look as a teenager you know again maybe i was a little too intense but, um, but, uh, you know, I, I did my first record when I was 21 and, and, and uh, my first real professional record uh, that I released and all that stuff. And, 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 you know, it was good enough that we got gigs opening for Ted Nugent and Bad Company. Nice. And, you oh. know, we were play we played, and that was like in a 10,000, 20,000 seat arena. Um, so, so anyway, you know, that's, that's what the, the, that's what the insane obsession will get you. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, so that was tricky. Um, finding people that took it as seriously as I did. And um, that was really, that was really hard. So over the years though, what I've learned and look, this is what's right for me. I'm not saying this is right for anybody else, but I became a solo artist because I've always been the most serious person about it. And, you know, anytime there's a group of people, there will be some people that do all the work and some people that coast. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got sick of that. And I was like, well, I'm doing all the work anyway. I might as well be the main artist. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and so once I kind of had that in my head, I decided like the only person that, that, that is indispensable to this group is me. And that's not mm-hmm. to say, I don't mean that arrogant way to say that other people didn't contribute. I'm just saying that I'm the one that spent all the money doing everything. Mm-hmm. I'm the one that paid, I paid the musicians whether I get paid myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I took care of all the business. I wrote all the songs. I did all the arrangements. I did all the music business work. I did all the mm-hmm. booking. Yep. And I was like, so because I'm doing all that, I'm going to put myself in a position where I can't be disadvantaged by other people. So mm-hmm. I, I, 
I had to trade out band members on a regular basis uh, when they decided to move on, like they weren't serious enough about it or, mm-hmm. or, or they, or they, you know, or whatever, you know, I, I had to let some people go. And that's, that's never an easy thing. Cause I like, I, I, I like just about everybody. Um, mm-hmm. So it's never an easy thing to say, Hey, I'm sorry. I can't use you because you're not serious enough or, Hey, you know, we've been rehearsing now for six months and you're still making the same mistakes you did the first time we got together. I can't, you know, we can't keep doing this. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of hard, but uh, for me, being a solo artist is, is the best thing. Now I say all that and I work the band hard, but I'm very honest about what I expect. Mm-hmm. And I'm very honest about what I will give. And I'll say, I'll tell people like, here's the opportunity I'm providing you. Here are the conditions. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Here are the things you're going to do for me. If these interest you, then let's, let's do it. I'd love to have you on board. Mm-hmm. If they don't no hard feelings, I understand doesn't hurt my feelings at all. But don't commit to me and then and then not follow through because that will make me angry. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> and, for because, sure. Because I can't, I've worked really hard and I can't allow somebody else to affect my reputation because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. nobody cares that so and so didn't show up. They only care that Joey Stuckey mm-hmm. didn't keep his word. Exactly. And and that's as it should be. I don't have a problem with that. But mm-hmm. so so my point is like, so for me, but all that being said, like we have a great time. The guys in my band are my brothers. I mean, they not, not physical, like literal brothers, but yeah, I love them. They're friends. We, we love hanging out with each other, but I'm very, to to, to sort of put the cap on the question. Mm -hmm. I am, when I first got started, I wasn't this way, but now I am very, very careful and very, very particular about who I let into my, my inner sanctum. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and so I only, I only let people into my inner sanctum and invite them to participate when I really think they're the right fit. And that's completely understood. If you demand that, and if you're willing to give the level that you do, you, you should demand it. Well, and the thing is they, and and they all respect it and they all know, and and I'm, I'm a, I'm a producer and arranger for a living. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave certain things up to the individual musician, but I'll say, Hey, you know, at this particular Mm -hmm. part, I need you to do this. At this particular part, I need you to do this. Then I'll leave some things up to their creativity, but you know they're my songs, and and there are certain things that I want, and mm-hmm. and they res- they respect that. You know they yeah. respect they respect so, and we have a blast. I mean, we have so much fun on tour. These guys are, are you know I've gotten to the point in my career and in my life that the people that I'm surrounded with are 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 family, not just friends or acquaintances. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really that makes a big difference. That it does. That it does. I could tell you stories from my first like dad rock band I was in. <laughs> I was I was the only single guy. So I paid for all the stuff. I did all the calling. I did all the the practice. I ran the practice and, this yeah. and all that other stuff. Well, because that's exactly what I did. I mean, you're, you're right. Exactly I mean, what it is. If you want it, you got to go and do it. You got to make it work. But that's what being a solo artist like is all about, ain't it? Yeah. Like I mean, it. it's, just, it's just it's just the fact that there's control. So you don't. You don't mm-hmm. now now the way things are set up, you know, uh, and they have been set up this way since I was about 25 years old. But in the early days, I just had bands. We were all sort of democratic and whatever. Uh, but I still ended up doing all the work. And mm-hmm. eventually I realized that that just wasn't wasn't going to cut it uh, because I wanted I wanted this to be my life, not just a hobby or something like that. And for some guys, they're like, hey, we want to play on the weekends and, you know, we want to go out and have a good time. And it's just for fun. And that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. That's totally fine. But everybody has to be on the same page. Yep. You know, that's so I mean, there's nothing wrong with just doing it for fun. That's great. Uh, oh, yeah. But if you want to do it seriously, you know, there's there's extra work that comes with that. Mm-hmm. And they got to be ready for it, too. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Otherwise, they're going to be like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I understand a lot of that. a lot of like some of the guys, like one of the guys in my band is married. And, you know, there's a lot of times that he's home late because we're working late. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his wife just has to be cool with it. And she is, you know, Mm -hmm. because, because I was like, look, man, you know, your domestic arrangement is not my problem. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's like, it's true. Your, your wife has to be okay with, you know, you being out late with the band, if you want to commit. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's something she can't do, I understand. No problem. God bless you. I, we're still friends but we you can't play <laughs> you know <laughs> so so it, it's just yeah. but yeah I, I, that's but th- these guys are really i mean like i said they're i'm, I'm very honest about what's what's going to happen mm-hmm. and, and you know we 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 fly out to la and we, we, we we'll drive up to new york and we'll do mm-hmm. whatever we have to do exactly and that's you you make it happen 
That's the biggest thing. Got to. Have to. All right. So how has your composition changed over time? I think um, like, I think it's I think it's gotten I think in the last little while mm-hmm. uh, since about 2000 well since 2017 it's been a little more narrowly focused than mm-hmm. usual um, and and I think because I've found some things that work for me uh, mm-hmm. really well. And so uh, I'm kind of creating more in that universe. Yeah. Um, when I first started, you know, like my first album that I released was all over the place. I mean, it had, it had like a rockabilly song. It had like a, a big band sort of jazz song that turned into mm-hmm. thrash metal at the end. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was, it was just got hard. thrown for a loop. Oh yeah, dude. It, it, it's um, the name. The name of that song, if you ever want to look it up, is called "My Sociology." Okay. And uh, it's 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 like this swampy jazz bar vibe for the first two thirds, mm-hmm. and then it turns into sort of thrash metal at the end. And um, you mentioned uh, Kansas uh, right. earlier. Mm-hmm. The violin player for Kansas was on that track as a oh, guest really? musician. Yeah, his name's David wow. Ragsdale. Yeah. He, so he's he's on that track and so he plays like sort of heavy metal violin um it's it's, it's really, down the georgia stuff yeah yeah it's really <laughs> cool so so um but anyway um you know i was just making art um mm-hmm. the bulk the bulk of the record was was rock um mm-hmm. but but there were some departures where i just said well you know this is what i wrote and mm-hmm. um and so so I, I think it's become i think i've become a little more focused uh as a writer uh it's certainly gotten easier I've gotten mm-hmm. better at it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think if I had to say anything, it's, it's become a little more narrowly defined, not mm-hmm. because I'm still not eclectic. I am, mm-hmm. but I've just learned how to parlay different aspects of my creative side into ways that seem to work real well um, financially. So, so mm-hmm. it's not like I, it's not like I don't write the other stuff, but uh, I, I have learned to focus my records a little more where they're not quite so, spastic <laughs> for, for you know they're just they're just very mm-hmm. you know they're just very uh, uh the, the they're, they're much more i mean I, when you listen to the last record i put out which was in the shadow of the sun mm-hmm. uh it still has a wide uh umbrella um there's mm-hmm. still a lot of variety there but there's also a lot of cohesion so uh, the first record was just all over the place. I didn't care. I just did what I did. And I was like, I am, I'm an artist. You can like it. You can hate it. I don't really care. And I still feel that way to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. But I have learned, I think, to get, to get a record that's a little bit more cohesive and focused uh, over the years. So you're meaning more of a theme, not so much random tracks that don't have any assimilation together. Like right. That. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So things, you know, things that, that, you know, if you listen to the first album and you listen to it all the way through, there is a journey there. I mean, I put the songs in sequence for a reason, Yeah. but it's still, you know, it's a surprise when, you know, all of a sudden like a country ballad pops up in the middle of a rock record. It, it, it's you know it's a surprise when all of a sudden you sound like you're in a bar with a with a woman ran, laying in a red dress on top of a piano singing to you uh and then it goes into thrash metal i mean it, it, it you know it it, it, yeah. it takes you it while i think artistically those songs have value mm-hmm. uh i think i think putting them on all on the same record takes you a bit out of the moment and, and it's kind of jarring <laughs> you know so but that you know when i was 21 i just i didn't care <laughs> i was like whatever uh, this is what understood. i wrote this yeah. is it this is joey yeah. right this here is it. So, and, and I, i'm not i'm not saying you can't do that i just say i think over, i just think over the years i've learned how to mm. channel you know certain certain vibes and you know each record has a different flavor and it should mm. but i feel like i've done a better job at, at putting compositions that match together and and coming up with ways to make them more complementary and not so jarring that's understood. That way, the flow as you go track to track to track gives you more of listen to the whole album feel. Absolutely, that's that's still important to tracks. me. That really is, and it needs to be. Yeah, because that's that's one piece of 
collection storyline art in itself all together and if it doesn't then it's like it's like listening to that album and then there's like man it would have done so much better without these three songs it, yeah absolutely it didn't add any value to what was existing in there yeah i'd rather Just do less make than more 10 or 15 yeah absolutely you're absolutely mm -hmm. right absolutely right and that's one thing i noticed about like the music off the site that was recommended or that was sent to me was about every song was at least five minutes or more and yeah i, I respect the crap out of that because i i'm tired of this three minute turnover song stuff that. well you know that's that's the pop formula mm, um and, that's and, the radio and, formula <laughs> and and the fact of the matter is we're not going to be played on on commercial radio um so. we 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 are we're on non-commercial radio <laughs> so we're on mm. mom and pop stations that play triple a americana we're mm. on college radio yep. you know stuff like that and that's where that's where we live uh as far as terrestrial radio is concerned so we don't have to worry about three minutes um the reason, you know, I think the song should be as long as it needs to be. If mm -hmm. your songs, if your songs two minutes and that says everything you want to say, okay, great. If your mm -hmm. songs Good. seven minutes and that says what you want to say, great. Realize you probably won't get played on the radio, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that being <laughs> said, I, I've had a couple of songs of mine I thought would never be heard on the radio, but the college radio people will play anything that mm -hmm. they like. If they like it, they'll play it. Oh yeah. And that's how radio used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it used to be the DJs had the control. Uh, but now, you know, radio is all about money and business and advertising mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's another reason people want the song short on the on the big commercial radio stations is they want to fit in more advertisement. Yeah, because so, they cut in and out. It gives yeah. them more opportunity for it, just like TV shows. I mean, every yeah, absolutely TV anymore is more the more cuts in it to drag it out longer. That's right. It's almost absurd. So it's annoying, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. All right, I'll give you one more question before we move on to uh, our analysis segment. Perfect. Is if you could master one skill set in the music industry, what would it be and how would you use it? That's an interesting question. Well, you know, to have a career, you have to have the basic tools as an artist, you have to be able to write, mm -hmm. you have to be able to perform, you have to be able to play your instrument, you know, whether it's singing or, or some other instrument, mm -hmm. you know, I, I play guitar and sing, but uh, in bass as well. I and mean, then I dabble with a couple other instruments, but you have to, you have to have that, you know, you have to have those basic skills just to get into the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those are sort of the absolute quintessential things you have to have. I have a mastery of recording. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's a skill that a lot of artists don't have, but I have that one down. That's actually where I started. I started recording first. Mm -hmm. So the one skill that I'm constantly working on and constantly trying to master, and this is the skill that's going to make or break your career is marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I continually work to master marketing and with social media, the way it is, and with fads, the way they are, we are what works today may not work six months from now. Mm -hmm. So I, I spend more of my time than I want uh, trying to understand the trends of what's going on with social media, what's going on with distribution, what's going mm -hmm. on with digital outlets, what's going on with radio. So stay, you know, reading Billboard magazine, mm -hmm. you know, staying, staying on top of what's happening so I can be prepared for that. So that's, I haven't mastered it because mm -hmm. it's a continual process. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anyone can master it. So the best thing to do is to find people that are smarter than you mm -hmm. and who, who are up at the top of the food chain and see if you can't learn from them, whether it's books mm -hmm. or meeting them in person or taking a master class or going to college or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what I would say. No, that's understood. I, I'll be honest, I hate marketing. I oh, me too. Like <laughs> my, my work needs to speak for myself and then people will come to it. Yeah. But that also comes with very slow progress too. True. So it's, it's hard to, hard to have growth and carry momentum if you don't put yourself out there. So, well, I tell, I tell my, I tell my students, I'm like, you know, fire. if I, if I, I don't really enjoy social media that much. I mean, mm -hmm. it's handy to keep up with births and weddings and stuff like that, but I don't really, I don't really need to know every thought that comes out of somebody's head, you know, mm -hmm. on social media. And if I weren't trying to sell records uh, or studio services, I wouldn't be on social media at all. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, exactly. I just, I just wouldn't be on it. 
but mm-hmm. you know, but but what I've found the best way to if you don't like marketing, which nobody in their right mind should, um, but if you don't like marketing, the best way to be on social media is to realize that you don't have to be on every platform, and you just need to post on the platform that you actually spend time on anyway Mm -hmm. and post things that are true to your brand. So understand what your brand is and what it isn't and do things that are consistent with that and do things that are fun for you because otherwise they'll come across as disingenuous and it won't help you. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And people can read disingenuity. Oh yes. However you want to say it easy. So yeah, people know. People oh yeah, know. hands down, it's like a part of our safety mechanism nowadays. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. And that is end of segment one. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
website. All right. The first song that I wanted to talk about was 10,000 Miles. Oh, cool. I thought this one in itself was pretty interesting just for how it opens up. Okay. I probably have to hear that. Yay. Yep. I got it. Okay. Cool. So, what I think is neat. It's just how spacious this feels, how open it is. With it sounds like you're droning on a synth. That's right. Nice little lead line. right <laughs> <laughs> i knew exactly where to stop that <laughs> you did you did a great job yeah um i tried to prep as much as i can trust me so i i really love the fact that you, when you're using a synth and something i'm finding out the more that i'm using these kind of plugins for synths is if i try to stack full chords on it it doesn't have the same effect as it was if you were to just drone maybe the root note for your chord progression whatever you're using Absolutely. Yeah. And that's my limited keyboard skills coming to coming to fruition there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love that you I love that you feel that it has a lot of space because that was the goal. And I actually mm -hmm. um, for the vocal, I actually, uh, although I am putting some delay on it, I actually mm -hmm. like put, put the microphone at one end of the room and I sang it all at the other end of the room. Oh, did um, you? Yeah. Yeah. So that's because it sounds no, like you're super far away. Did yeah, you like why. use your full voice from across the room? I did. You had to have. Yeah. So I, I, oh, okay. I that's, that's, that's why that's, there's such a space in there. And, and you're let that droning is really important. You want to, you want to let it just kind of sink in and, and mm -hmm. give it some gravitas. No, for sure. Because it definitely, what you were targeting there, you could feel every bit of it. And as it progressed, as you were going through, it was, uh, to me, it was very evident that, the layering as it was coming in made it really cool and it could last a longer period of time because you start introducing these little lines that stack all right hold on joey i'm gonna pause real quick sure on um, because guess what 